So you remember Pasteur was very fond of, of uh, racemic and tartaric acid. So when he'd travel around, he would look for samples of tartaric acid. There are very uh, detailed accounts that he published of these travels. I haven't found this one, so I'm not sure it's true. It may be apocryphal, but it was told me by the guy who taught me organic chemistry, so I pass it on to you for what it's worth because it makes a good point. He said that Pasteur was in Alsace, the wine-producing region in northeast France, and in the town of Tan, he found in a pharmacy a bottle of racemic acid that was moldy. So remember, racemic acid is the 50-50 mixture. So since he liked racemic acid, and in fact it was becoming rare, it's not a very common product, mostly you get the handed stuff. So he took it back and, and cleaned it up, got rid of the, the uh, mold that was growing on it. And what he found was that after he had purified it, it was the unnatural, the left-handed, not the one you normally get. Can you see an explanation for that? Why would, did, had the apothecary mislabeled it because he thought he could get a higher price for racemic than for tartaric acid? <laughs> or might he have been innocent? Zach? Was it the mold by any chance? What, what, would, what did the mold do? It might have converted one into all. Into didn't unstable. convert. Okay. The mold ate the natural stuff, converted it into something completely different, <laughs> leaving um, the unnatural one. Okay. <laughs> Remember the smell of the car bones? Natural things, enzymes and so on, can distinguish between the two hands. And naturally, the stuff that normally eats tartaric acid is going to eat normal tartaric acid, not the unusual one. So it left the unusual one. The penicillium glaucum had eaten the RR. Okay, so that's one way of doing, uh, of doing resolution, to get rid of one enantiomer from a racemic mixture, leaving the other one. Uh, because diastereomeric reactions have different rates. It's a right hand shaking a right hand versus a right hand shaking a left hand. They're just different. So one will go faster than the other. So you, if you react a racemate with some chiral reagent, of course you have to use only one hand of that other thing you add in there, but then you'll react with one more than the other. It could be even a catalyst so that it doesn't get consumed, for an enzyme for example. But that's not nature's way because it's very inefficient to make both and then destroy one. What nature does is prepare only one enantiomer. And you can do that, prepare only one, by starting with something that's already a single enantiomer and building on that. Or you can use a reagent which is resolved that will, that because diastereomeric rates are different, will tend to produce one, uh, one of the two enantiomers. So here's an example of this molecule we've been talking about, Azi7389, with its 19 asymmetric centers that's made artificially, commercially. Uh, and this is where those 19 centers came from. Five of them came from starting materials that they bought as a single hand. But the rest were all made. One of them was done by chromatography. They have chromatography columns about this big around and this high with chiral stuff inside. So you pass your thing through, one hand goes through a little faster than the other because it's di di diastereomeric interaction with the packing. One comes through quicker, and they actually do that to, for one of the centers. But the others are all done by reactions that preferentially give one center rather than the other. Three of them are ones that everybody knew which one they would give. The other ones they just had to, to hope and, and fiddle around with different reactions until they found one that would do the trick. So anyhow, they were able to generate these 19 stereocenters. Now, we're left with a problem. Uh, that, that, incidentally, is all we're going to have for the exam on Friday. Okay, so now we're on to other stuff that will be covered on the final exam. And in particular, return to this question about the tartaric acids. Remember, there's D plus and L minus. Could you have L plus and D minus of a different compound? Why not? What does D or L mean in this context? Andrew? It means which way it rotates the light, right? And the plus means the same thing as D. So it's redundant, this particular nomenclature. But there's a question mark, because when F Fisher just guessed, remember, 
And it could easily have been the opposite. So which way is it, right? So if we knew, if we knew how optical activity worked, then by measuring the optical activity, we'd know which of those structures is right, okay? But we don't know that. At least, I don't know that. Now, there's a lot of knowledge about this, but it's a very, very tough problem. Fortunately, uh, there's a book by Lawrence Barron called Molecular Light Scattering and Optical Activity, which goes into this stuff. And I see <laughs> Professor Vicar. Oh, so we have a copy of the book. That's great. But even better than that, we have Lawrence Barron. Or a copy of Lawrence Barron. Or a copy of Lawrence Barron. Perhaps it's the mirror image of Lawrence Barron. So he's going to tell us how this works. Clicker. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I was both um, delighted and dismayed at the same time when Professor McBride asked me to try and, uh, uh, well, to, to address you this morning. Delighted to have the opportunity to talk science to some of America's uh, brightest budding young scientists but also dismayed that he asked me to try and explain the molecular or origin of optical rotation, optical activity. It's a very subtle, difficult, delicate problem that's exercised some of the finest minds in physics and chemistry for the last hundred years. But anyway, let's see how it goes. Towards the end, I think I may be presenting some stuff that's sort of beyond the boundaries of your current knowledge, but anyway, it can at least pass in front of your eyes. <laughs> So, chirality then means, as you well know, right or left-handedness. It pervades much of modern science, from the physics of elementary particles through organic stereochemistry to the structure and behavior of the molecules of life. With a, a, a lot more besides, it comes up in what's called nonlinear optics involving intense lasers, nanotechnology, materials, electrical engineering, pharmaceuticals, astrobiology and origin of life. So it's, it's, it's a very important uh, theme in, in, in modern science. Now, first of all, though, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a little bit about Lord Kelvin. He was the first person um, to introduce the word chirality into science. He was professor of natural philosophy in Glasgow, which is my home university, um, through um, most of his career, he, he, well, all of his career, he was one of the giants of physics of the, of the 19th century. Um, he's best known for inventing the absolute uh, Kelvin temperature scale. Now, he was originally, his original name was William Thomson, but then he became famous and became Sir William Thomson. Then he became even more famous, so they made him... A, a lord, and when you're made a lord in the UK, you choose your title from some place that's dear to your heart, maybe your home area. He took his title from the, the, the name of the River Kelvin, which runs through the University Park in Glasgow. So whenever you use the absolute temperature scale now in the future, you can picture this uh, idyllic scene. Anyway, so he was the first to introduce the word chirality into science, and here's his definition, which you'll be familiar with, I call any geometrical figure or group of points chiral and say it, that it has chirality if its image in a plane mirror ideally realized cannot be brought into coincidence with itself. That was in his Baltimore lectures. So he's just emphasizing the non-superimposability of the mirror image enantiomers of a chiral molecule. But of course, the whole subject started uh, earlier with uh, the, the wonderful work of Louis Pasteur, who showed um, <laughs> Mirror image chiral molecules show optical rotation of equal magnitude but opposite sign, which was um, an epoch-making discovery. So you've come across then this, uh, the fundamental manifestation of um, optical activity, which is natural optical rotation. You put linearly polarized light beam into a sample, say, example of, of uh, an isotropic collection of chiral molecules like a sugar solution, and it will come out the other side with the plane of polarization rotated through some angle. And if you put in the mirror image version, you'll get an equal but opposite sense of optical rotation. 
Now, it's not to be confused with something called magnetic optical rotation, the Faraday effect. I'm just mentioning this to you. You probably haven't come across the Faraday effect yet, but you may do later on in your studies or in your professional life. So I'll mention the Faraday effect. Faraday discovered in 1846 that achiral samples, not, not, no, no, optical, no natural optical activity there, if you apply a static magnetic field parallel to the light beam, that will induce an optical rotation. And if you put in, if you reverse the direction of the magnetic field relative to the light beam, you'll get an equal and opposite sense of optical rotation. Um, you know, it would even work, say, for a, a sample of water, for instance. Any material will show a Faraday effect. But this has been a source of uh, much confusion, in fact, um, uh, to scientists. Now, Lord Kelvin was on the ball here. He knew all about it. He's, he made a statement here. He said, the magnetic rotation has neither right-handed nor left-handed quality. That is to say, no chirality. It's got nothing to do with chirality. This was perfectly understood by Faraday and made clear in his writings. Yet even to the present day, we frequently find the chiral rotation and the magnetic rotation of the plane of polarization classed together in a manner against which Faraday's original description contains ample warning. Well, Lord Kelvin would be turning in his grave today, a hundred years later, because you still see papers um, which involve the Faraday effect in some way or other, and in the introduction they talk grandly of inducing chirality with a magnetic field. That is completely wrong. Um, just uh, for the record, it probably... Uh, be beyond your knowledge at the moment, chiral phenomena like natural optical rotation, they're characterized by what's called time-even pseudoscalar observables. A pseudoscalar is a number that changes sign under reflection or inversion. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that, but so that, that, that's for the record. But, well, the, it, it turns out the, the essential symmetry characteristics of natural and magnetic optical rotation are, are completely different, and you need different sorts of, um, you know, quantum molecular quantum states, different characteristics to support them. But we won't pursue that. Right, now, back to natural optical rotation. Um, so now we bring in circularly polarized light. So in order to detect molecular chirality, you must have some sort of chiral <coughs> probe. Well, what we're using here is right and left circularly polarized light beams. They are actually mirror image chiral systems, so they can be used as chiral probes. So here's a representation of a right circularly polarized light beam. Um, now, you, you know that light is, involves um, os electromagnetic oscillations in space, and usually you, you just think of the the oscillating electric vector of a light wave, and if it's linearly polarized, it's, it's oscillating in, in one plane. There's actually also an oscillating magnetic field vector that oscillates perpendicular to the electric. We'll come back to that later. This is, we're just looking at the oscillating electric vector here. So if it's linearly polarized, it's or plane polarized, it's just oscillating in a plane. But circularly polarized light, as well as an oscillation in this direction, you also have an electric vector oscillating perpendicular, but um, 90 degrees out of phase. And what happens is um, you get this circular polarization. Now, this picture here, this represents the instantaneous electric vectors at different points in space in the direction of propagation along the z direction. And so here we are, that's just uh, showing, that's just connected the ends of the instantaneous electric vectors. And there it is for left circularly polarized. Anyway, you can see that at the very least, those are, those are chiral, those are helical, and those are mirror image chiral systems. Now, ah, here we go. This, this is some extra fancy stuff that Professor McBride added to my... <laughs> Uh, my presentation, he doesn't like, it was too simple and static. Uh, anyway, so there we are. So, so now, if, if you look at the wave, if, if you just 
look at the electric vector through a f in a fixed plane as the light wave is propagating, there's the electric vector and it will rotate in the fixed plane. So rotating clockwise, that defines right circularly polarized light. And here we go. <coughs> rotating counterclockwise, that's left circularly polarized light. Okay, so we, we now have um, a chiral optical probe, circularly polarized light. Now, chiral molecules respond slightly differently to right and left circularly polarized light. Um, you know, an, I mean, an extreme example is, say, in the world of, of engineering, you, you know, you can't fit a, a left-handed nut onto a right-handed bolt. That's an extreme example of <laughs> different, uh, you know, uh, uh, chiral interactions. Well, it's obviously much more delicate than that here. But the point is right and left circularly polarized light interact just slightly differently with, with a, a molecule of a given chirality. Anyway. There's a differential absorption of right and left circularly polarized light. That corresponds to a phenomenon called circular dichroism, which is the basis of a widely used um, form of spectroscopy used uh, to study uh, chiral molecules. But now, what gives rise to optical rotation is a difference in refractive index towards um, of right and left circularly polarized light beams. Now, linearly polarized light, you, you can describe it as a coherent superposition of right and left circularly polarized waves of equal amplitude. Coherent means they're in phase with each other rather than being, you know, random. They're oscillating in phase with some fixed phase relationship. So, for example, now here's a linearly polarized um, um, light beam, but you can decompose it into a superposition of a left circular and a right circular component. You, you see, if, if when those are at the top, they're reinforcing, and uh, you've got the maximum uh, linearly polarized vector up here. As they come away, left and right, they will tend to increasingly cancel, and that will decrease. And at, when they're this way and this way, you'll have z zero um, electric field vector there. And as you come down, it will increase again. So you, so you, can, you can decompose a linear, linearly polarized light into a coherent superposition of, of left and right um, waves. Now, refractive index corresponds to uh, velocity through um, a medium. Um, so if there's a difference in refractive index for right and left circularly polarized light beams, that means there's a slight difference in the velocity of the right and left circularly polarized light beams going through the medium. So the phase relation between the two contra-rotating electric vectors will change. <coughs> and you can easily see this will give you a, a rotation in the plane of polarization. You see, if, if, if there's a difference in velocity, then at some instant, this vector will, this electric vectors of the left component will be here. And the right component here, and if you take the resultant, you see it's 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 no longer um, where it was. So, this is a simple picture of how optical rotation develops in terms of um, different refractive indices of the right and left components. Um, now, there's um, there's a, a picture in Atkins Physical Chemistry. He tries to illustrate this. There, he's got the linearly polarized beam coming through, and you've got the that he's broken it down into the left and right, and he's saying the two velocities are slightly different, and that gives you the resultant optical rotation. Um, you can easily develop um, an expression for the angle of rotation as a function of the difference in refractive indices for left and right circularly polarized light beams. And it's also it's a function of the path length. Obviously, the longer the path length, the, the, the more a rotation will develop. And um, it's, there's, there's the wavelength there in the denominator. In fact, I mean, this is the secret. This path length, that's the secret of how you get a measurable rotation, because this is an incredibly tiny effect. If it was just a single molecule event you're looking at, you, the polarization changes, you, you wouldn't see anything. They're so tiny. But you can build up this rotation over long path lengths, centimeters or even meters. 
Um, in fact, um, if, if you go to Google and do Google images and just Google circularly polarized light, you'll find lots of sites there which, which describe polarized light and they provide beautiful um, simulations, um, animations of of, of this effect here. I, I didn't want to download any and, and try and show them here, but I would encourage you to go to that. But go and look in particular at this site here, um, enzyme.hu. That comes from uh, an institute of enzymology in Budapest. They've got some beautiful simulations of this optical rotation process and, and other more um, exotic uh, polarization effects as light propagates through matter. Now, let's try and, uh, so, so that's, that's just, um, uh, what would you say, a phenomenological description. And in fact, that's where most physical chemistry textbooks stop. And in fact, Atkins' physical chemistry stops at that point and then just, there's just sort of hand waving saying, uh, okay, you know, right and left circularly polarized light interact slightly differently with, with the chiral <laughs> molecule and, and they leave it at that. They don't attempt to try and give you a, a picture in, uh, molecular detail, but uh, Professor McBride wanted me to try and attempt this. So just as a, as a start, uh, this is a simple, a simple picture, a simple scattering picture of, of optical rotation. Now, a circularly polarized light wave bouncing from one group to the other, um, as it scatters from a simple two-group chiral structure, will sample the chirality. So here we have a simple two-group chiral molecular structure. So we've got two achiral groups held in a rigid, twisted arrangement. I think that's, that's left-handed I've got there. Um, and you can break down, you look at most chiral molecules, just look at the bonds, you can often break them down. You can see these sorts of two-group structures uh, um, throughout. Um, anyway, so a particular model of optical <coughs> rotation is that the light wave, it bounces from one group to the other before coming off and getting involved in the, it generating the optical rotation phenomenon. Um, but you can see it's, it's sampling the chirality as it bounces from one to the other. So if the, if the light beam is right circularly polarized, that bouncing process will have a slightly different amplitude, as we say, from if it's left circularly polarized. So that gives you a simple picture. It's worth mentioning that, that this is the basis of something called the dynamic coupling model of optical activity that was developed by somebody called John Kirkwood, who was uh, chairman of this department in the 1950s. Um, Well, now, we really have to, <laughs> we, we have to grasp the nettle at this point <laughs> because you just, it's hopeless messing around with these, these simple models. They, they, it, they don't get you anywhere as regards prediction, you know, uh, uh, relating uh, structure to sign and magnitude of, of optical activity. You have to go to the quantum mechanics. So now, this was the expression for the optical rotation in terms of the, the refractive index difference for left and right <coughs> circularly polarized light. Now, you can develop this using something called quantum mechanical perturbation theory. And you develop an expression for the rotation angle in terms of this uh, incomprehensible looking stuff. But let me just try and give you a, a feel for what, it, uh, what it's telling us that the heart of it is this so-called rotational strength, which involves this so-called scalar product of an electric dipole and a magnetic dipole transition moment. So what we've got here is there's the ground state of the molecule N, J is some excited electronic state, and mu is the electric dipole operator that's connecting the ground to the excited state. And and the light wave is, is, is interacting, is coupling with this electric dipole operator and it's driving the transition. And it's this, these electric dipole transitions like this, that's the behind conventional spectroscopy. You've done probably UV and infrared um, spectroscopy. But now what we have in addition 
is the same transition, but now brought about through the M, that's called a magnetic dipole operator, and that's activated by this oscillating magnetic component of the light wave. Um, and so you have this, this so-called scalar product, that, so mu dot M, that would be mu x mx plus mu y my plus <laughs> mu z nz. Some of you have probably done vectors, maybe others haven't, but okay. So that, that's the heart of it, but this is a very important feature here. We're summing over all excited states J, all excited states. So the whole plethora of excited states of a chiral molecule um, come in here, and some can, can give you, a, one particular excited state can give you a positive contribution to the optical rotation, another one a negative. You know, so it, it's a very, uh, very subtle problem, and, um, and you have to to consider them all carefully. So optical activity ultimately originates in interference between electric and magnetic dipole transitions during the light scattering process. That's the, that's at the heart of it. Now, let me just show you how this works out. I can now g give you a, 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 a chemical, uh, an interpretation in terms of um, of a real and highly important system in, in organic chemistry, the carbonyl chromophore. I believe you have come across the carbonyl chromophore. A lot of important organic molecules contain this carbonyl chromophore. It gives rise <laughs> to a transition in the near ultraviolet at about 290 nanometers, and it's widely used in or, or physical organic chemistry. In, um, it's called the N to pi star transition. Now, the carbonyl group itself, here it is, that's not chiral, that, that's got a plane of symmetry. So it, it, by itself, it's not go, there's going to be no um, optical activity there. But you see, in this particular molecule here, 3-methyl cyclohexanone, that molecule overall is chiral. There's a chiral center there. So that carbonyl group is experiencing a, you know, a chiral perturbation, a through space perturbation from the rest of the chiral molecule. And that induces chirality into the electronic transitions of the carbonyl group and induces optical rotation and circular dichroism. Well, let's look at this in a bit more detail, this uh, famous N to pi star transition. So, here we've got the, the, the sigma bonding orbital of the carbonyl group. There's the pi bonding orbital made up of two, uh, uh, the p pi on carbon and on oxygen. And uh, here is a lone, here, here, sorry, here is a, a py orbital. So, so those, are, those are px orbitals. That's, that's the py orbital on the oxygen. Feed electrons in, and so you've got two in the ground state. You've got two there, two there, and you've got two electrons in the py orbital. So those are lone pair electrons. So the the, the lowest order, the, the lowest transition now, is the the py to pi star, often called the n to pi star transition. You're promoting one electron from the py orbital up to the pi star orbital, and that's the that's the origin of of this. Uh, transition. Well, let's, ah, now, okay. Now this transition, it happens to be fully magnetic dipole allowed, but completely electric dipole forbidden. What happens is electric dipole character is induced by mixing, well, I'm giving the example of, of, an op of a higher oxygen dyz orbital into the pi star orbital. Now, Professor McBride has been messing around <laughs> with my <laughs> presentation here. Let's see what he's done. So, <laughs> here, so here's, the, here's the n orbital, uh, the, the py orbital of the carbonyl group. There's the pi star. Ah, now here we go. So this is now, and it, the, we're, yes, so here you can see in, in that n to pi star transition, there's, there's a net rotation of, of charge, a rotation of charge, and that's 
that's the, the, the essence of, of the magnetic dipole allowed character. Magnetic dipole on transitions involve a rotation of charge. And the reason we've messed about with it in this way is we've seen the mixing of p orbitals change in the orientation causing it to rotate that way. Right. So what's ah, okay, now here we go again. Now here's a dyz orbital. Now, one could consider a whole loads of other possible orbitals to mix in, but this is the, the simplest one to just to illustrate the, the idea here. So there's a dyz orbital. Now, going from, you see, n to dyz, you, if, if you add the, those orbitals together, the, 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 uh, you, you tend to get a displacement of charge in the, in the, um, in the z direction. So now you see you have a combination of a rotation of charge with a displacement of charge and rotation plus translation gives helicity. And here we go. There. So by mixing in a little bit of the, um, this dxz <coughs> orbital, um, you get this, which is electric dipole allowed, you get this, um, this helicity in, in the transition. Now, in fact, um, the, the rotation of, of charge generates a magnetic dipole perpendicular to the, to the um, uh, plane of rotation, and it's pointing that way, so you'll get a an mz component, a component of the magnetic moment along the z-axis. Here you can see immediately you've got a component of the electric dipole along the z-axis. So that generates a mu z mz component uh, from this scalar product of mu and m in, in, in the rotational strength. So th this is uh, sort of <coughs> ma making a meal of it here now. So we're, we're just putting down these so-called quantum mechanical matrix elements. So here we've got n to pi star with a little bit of that mixed in, and that's fully magnetic dipole allowed. Then we have n to pi star, which is forbidden electric dipole, but mixing that in gives you a little bit of electric dipole character. And so you now get a non-zero contribution to the rotational strength. However, you wouldn't want to go, go on and, and, and actually calculate the optical rotation of the carbonyl chromophore in some situation from this. Because, as I said, there's many other excited electronic states you, you could have also considered, which may be giving opposite um, contributions to, to the rotational strength. You have to sum them all. And to do that, you now have to go to modern um, ab initio quantum chemistry, quantum chemical uh, calculations. There's wonderful programs out now uh, from Gaussian and Dalton. You can calculate all sorts of uh, molecular properties with, with quite good, uh, very good accuracy in, in many cases. But this now turns it all into, into a black box procedure. You just feed in appropriate atomic orbitals and uh, press buttons and turn handles, whatever you do for these calculations, and out will pop some um, physical quantity. So, so you can calculate this, this whole thing ab initio and taking in uh, however many excited states in the, in the sum are necessary. And you can, you can calculate that the sign and magnitude of the optical rotation for a given absolute configuration, so you, you would feed into the calculation whether it's the S or the R absolute stereochemistry, so you'd put that in, and that will determine the sign of the optical rotation that comes out. And so, um, I mean, in this particular case, this small molecule, the S absolute configuration goes with the plus rotation and the R goes with the minus. Um, so from the calculation, then, you can relate the sign of the optical rotation to the absolute stereochemistry. But you wouldn't want to stake your life on it because it's not completely reliable. You, it usually gives the right answer for smaller molecules, but not always. And for example, if, if, if this was um, 
as, as you know, and I think you'll hear more after my uh, talk here, um, many drugs now are, are chiral, and com drug companies um, like to market now single enantiomer versions of the drug. So it's a tremendously important problem for them to, to know with absolute certainty the absolute configuration of the particular enantiomer they're marketing because they, if they make a mistake <coughs> and specify the wrong absolute configuration in their patent, they can literally lose billions of dollars. Um, anyway, there's, uh, there's the, the famous, the importance of, of chirality in, in drugs is uh, exemplified by the famous thalidomide uh, case, but I won't elaborate that anymore. I think Professor McBride is going to tell you uh, some more of that in more detail. I should say that the, 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 the cornerstone, the definitive method for determining absolute configuration has for some years now been something called the bifoot method of anomalous x-ray scattering, which again, have, have, Professor, have you told them about that? Yeah. yeah, that's the definitive method, but it's sort of cheating because you're actually seeing, <laughs> you're seeing it through, through x-ray eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but even then, they, they, they can, you can occasionally make mistakes. But I, I should just mention also, there are some newer optical activity techniques involving something called vibrational optical activity. Here we've been looking at optical activity in electronic transitions using visible light. But in recent years, newer methods measuring optical activity in vibrational transitions have come along. And these are actually comparable with X-ray anomalous X-ray scattering for uh, reliability of absolute configuration. That's because the, the, these calculations are much more reliable for this, these vibrational optical activity phenomena than electronic ones. Well, that's about it. That's all I would like to say now. So thank you for listening. <laughs> oh. You were unwantedly quiet, not like you usually are. Any questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, I'm just wondering if the magnitude of the Faraday rotation uh, can ever interfere with the measurement of optical rotation in a chiral material. That is to say, if one situates a polarimeter in proximity to an NMR spectrometer, for example. No. No, I know you wouldn't need to worry about that at all. No, you, might, you need a reasonable strength of magnetic field just applied uh, directly through the sample. Yeah. Lucas, um, just testing my understanding, uh, the end of high star is uh, Menon dipole allowed, electric dipole forbidden, <coughs> and that's why then The electric, electric yeah. yeah. In there, that contribution. Yes. Uh, no <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks again. What? Pleasure. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah. this is just a plug this afternoon. The, the reason Professor Barron is here is he's the Tettleman Lecturer in Jonathan Edwards College. So he's giving a talk for the history majors and so on, but it'll be very interesting for anyone. And I think since we're into chirality, you would enjoy this, particularly this afternoon in Davies Auditorium at 5 o'clock. But there's the question, who cares? No offense. But who cares? Why do we care about chirality? Well, Professor Barron hinted at it. Living things care because they're chiral, right? So which one they react with, okay? The Food and Drug Administration cares for the same reason with respect to uh, medications you might be taking. Drug companies care a lot, and their lawyers, and the U.S. Patent Office care a lot, right? 
which has generated a thing called a chiral switch. Most drugs that used to be developed were developed as racemates because it was difficult to separate the two hands. But if your patent runs out on the racemate and you can resolve it and now sell just one of them, and if it's better and the FDA will approve it, and you can convince people that that's the one they should buy, then you can go back to not having to compete with generic drug companies anymore and charge $5 a pill instead of 50 cents a pill. Okay? So this so-called chiral switch to go from racemic to a single enantiomer is a big movement nowadays. For example, consider this pain reliever. Let's figure out what it is. Do you remember what that group is? Four carbons in that sort of Mercedes structure? You know what that, what that group's called? This, 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 what we're doing for the rest of the lecture here, however, it is, is actually review for the exam on Friday. It, you're not specifically responsible for it, but it's review. So you know that group? Isobutyl. Okay. And what acid is that with three carbons, do you know? The first fatty acid? Propionic acid. And in the middle we have phenyl group, okay? So, what's the name of the drug? Sherwin? Ibuprofen. Advil or Motrin. Okay, now in this case you have a chiral center there, right, because there's a hydrogen on there that we don't see. And the S form is a pain reliever, it's said to be so anyhow, and the R is inactive, right? But it's marketed as a racemate, right? One might try doing a chiral switch and selling only the S, but the trouble is that it very quickly racemizes inside you, so it wouldn't be doing any good, right? Because you'd do all the work of selling the S and then it would become R immediately when you ate it. And here's another one, this is the one that Professor Barron was referred to, which is a sedative, thalidomide, and there's the chiral center in that one because there's an H on there. So the S form is a sedative, but the R form, at least it's said, is a teratogen, which means it, it makes monsters. <laughs> and it's not so funny because it was sold as a racemate from 1957 to 62, never in the U.S. because the FDA didn't, uh, be, they were lucky and never approved it. But in Europe, it caused 10,000 birth defects, children born without arms, without legs, things like that. So it was a tragedy. Uh, but this one also undergoes in vivo racemization. Okay. These, you can find rate constants for these. It's curious that the rate of S going to R and the rate of R going to S are not the same. It must, there must, there's got to be more to it than that, that one has to be more stable than the other of these mirror images, if that's true. It may be that the rates aren't exactly true, but if so, they must be bound to something that makes, that's chiral, that makes one of them more stable than the other. Anyhow, that's how fast they go back and forth, and this is how fast they get eliminated from the body. One gets eliminated much faster than the other. And if you put these things together, you can see how the concentration should vary with time if it's going according to that rate. So the blue one, the one that's good for you, quickly drops off. The bad one, the teratogen, grows quickly. So you have maybe two hours of 24 hours where you got a lot more of the good one than the bad one. So essentially this drug is completely off limits especially for any women that could conceivably, under any circumstances, be pregnant. Okay. So, uh, but it's a wonderful drug for things like leprosy and so on. Uh, 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 David here is an MD as well as a professor of chemistry, and you probably know more about that, but it's a wonderful drug for certain things, isn't that right? That's right, that's right. It's still actually in, in common usage for anxiety disorders. Yeah, but there are all sorts of warnings in letters this big about if, you're, if you have a chance of getting pregnant, stay away from this baby, right? In fact, even if, if you're a male patient taking it and your wife is pregnant or likely to become pregnant, you're encouraged not to take it wow. because of possible contamination. Wow. Okay, so now here's, here's a drug. We're going to look at the name of this one. It's a really whopper of a name, right? So let's just use this as a practice about nomenclature. Okay, so that thing there is called imidazole, and the 1H tells where, which one has a hydrogen on it, right? Okay, so that's the position one. And that is the benzene ring, so ben. So it's benzimidazole, that group on the right. 
and you number it. Remember, it was one H. There's an H on the nitrogen one there. And you go around the <coughs> ring and number in that conventional way. Okay, now, but then you notice that there's something on the, uh, the, on the number five, and there's something on the number two carbons of that ring. On five, there's a methoxy group, which appears first among all the things in this na in the named here, not the thing that's on two. Why is the methoxy group first? Do you remember what the rule is? How do you arrange the substituent groups? Angela? Alphabetically, M is going to be the first one. Okay, so 5-methoxy, and then 2 is sulfinyl. That S with an O on it is called sulfinyl group. Okay, so it's 2-sulfinyl, but now there are all sorts of curly brackets and square brackets and so on to tell what's attached to that. Okay, so attached to that is, a, uh, is methyl group, but the methyl is substituted, so it's methyl sulfinyl. Okay, that's the, that's the uh, curly, the square brackets. Okay, now what's on the methyl? There's a pyridine group, the benzene with a nitrogen, this pyridine, and it's substituted on the methyl at its own two position. The two position of the pyridine is what's attached to the methyl, so it's, uh, so it's two pyridinyl at the end. But now on that, in the four position is methoxy, and methoxy comes alphabetically before methyl, not before D, but before methyl, and you don't count the dye, right? So there's the name of that compound. And this stuff is a drug, it's a gastric proton pump inhibitor, so it, it treats acid reflux disease. And it, it's the world's largest selling drug in the year 2000, $6.2 billion. And it's called omeprazole or Prilosec. And you've seen, probably some of you at least have seen boxes of Prilosec. I don't have, you hope you don't have to take it like I do occasionally. This is called OTC, we're going to be talking about that on Monday. Okay, so there it is. Now get your glasses up. Because, can you see this, it, it, can you see any sort of three dimensions here? What's in front or what's behind? Can anybody tell? You have any luck in seeing it in three dimensions? Some people can't see it, but most of you, like 95% of you should be able to see. It's not a really high quality three dimensions. And the, because the, the computer, the projector doesn't do it exactly right for the colors, so one eye sees only one and one sees only the other. Anybody see? Okay, now, what is chiral here? Can you see why this thing is chiral? There's no carbon with four different things on it. <coughs> well, what makes it handed? Can you see? In fact, there's no group that has four different things on it. Any suggestions? Uh, Lucas? Sulfur. sulfur. Sulfur has an unshared pair, an oxygen, and two different R groups. And which, which is pointing out toward you? Can, can you see it enough in three dimensions with the glasses to see that? To see which is pointing out? Yeah, it's the unshared pair that's pointing out. So if you use your thumbs and no, recognize that the unshared pair has the lowest atomic number, zero, right? Then you can do it, and you'll find out that that particular one drawn there is the S enantiomer, okay? So it's normal, the, the uh, uh, Meprazole, Prilosec, o, Prilosec, OTC are the racemate, but this one that's drawn here is the S isomer, and it's called what? s that's the name of it, right? And, or Nexium, right? And it's the S isomer. Right? So this is the product of one of these chiral switches, where for a long time the stuff was marketed as a racemate, and now they market it as a, a single enantiomer, or nexium. And we tried this one last time, so we're not going to spend time on it right now. Uh, that's what the class looks like when they're doing this. It's fun for me to see you. <laughs> okay. But there are other ways of doing the stereo viewing. You can use peris a pair of periscopes like this, right? And the way that works, of course, with the, the point is for each eye to see a different image. So if you want to try those and look at this after class, feel free or borrow them if you wish, right? So, so what, it, what the eyes perceive is a superposition in the middle. It's like this. There are two pictures. But, and if you can do it with the glasses, you can do it probably just by looking at this picture if you have a little while, but we don't have the little while now. The right eye will see that, the left eye will see that, and you see in the middle, they see the, something in the same position but in slightly different projections, so, uh, so the image in the middle of the three seems 
seems to be in 3D. Okay, now, uh, we don't have time to go, we're going to do a lot of uh, curved arrow stuff about how reactions happen in making omeprazole, and then, even more interesting, in the action of omeprazole that stops the stomach acid, but we'll have to wait until after the exam for that. Okay, thanks again to Professor Barron. <laughs>